Yeah, asked, how do you assess stability when discussing a contractor position? Um, let's see. So in terms of, I think there, there's a few questions that you can, can ask. And I think uh, what you'll want to do is, you know, if you're working with a recruiter, which you probably will be if you're, you're looking into a contract role, unless you're a 1099 employee, then you know, you kind of know your pay scale and all of that. I think a good indication is if you have been submitted to the client at what you consider a fair pay rate for your skill set, and that's comfortable, and that, that you can, can make work feasibly for six months. If you're not being backed into a number or asked to, like, you know, come back a couple of dollars, I think that's a pretty good indication that things are healthy, the budget is healthy. Um, another thing to, to find out is when you're, you're interviewing, ask about who, who your peers would be and how long they've been in the position and how they got there. Um, you can disguise that a little bit by asking what is the trajectory, you know, the career tra trajectory from here. Do you have an example of, of a past, um, you know, past person in this role that had great success here and in, in, in this position? Um, those are those are a couple of ways. Um, I think it's also, you know, stability is all relative, right? I think if you're a designer and you love going from project to project and you're pretty comfortable with that, um, it's going to be a little bit different for you than if you're somebody that, you know, potentially has a pre-existing condition or if you have three kids or, or anything like that. So, um, again, stability is relative, but don't be afraid to, to ask questions. I think that being overly communicative and transparent is going to be incredibly important. I mean, don't be entitled. Nobody wants that, but, but stick up for yourself. Ask those hard questions. Find out the things that are important to you because I, I feel like there's obviously a little bit of desperation right now to people that are unemployed. Um, to just take the next thing. And there is a point where you'll get to that. Um, and everybody gets to that at some point in their life or their career. Um, but if you have the ability to hold out and, and make sure that you're, you're getting your questions answered, that, that's important. Um, and at, at the very least, even if you're not sure about an opportunity, poke holes, always play devil's advocate. So um, one of our other questions, um, I know that this is, Women Code is a great place for networking. We're all here doing it right now. Um, but do you have any other suggestions on how to network or connect with people um, while most of us are potentially still at home? Um, I'll jump in here. I think you guys are probably all on LinkedIn to some degree, um, but LinkedIn is a really, really powerful tool. And I didn't really realize how powerful it was until I became a recruiter. Um, and I think that's because, you know, being a recruiter, we have a totally different perspective using it. Um, but it's also just forced me to just be on there more. And I think that it's a really, really positive environment. I, I, I know there's a lot of negativity on a lot of other social platforms right now. Um, I'll give you an example. If you see some posts, for instance, about Portland State, is the same post on LinkedIn as maybe Facebook. And you look at the comments on LinkedIn versus on Facebook, it's like a night and day difference in terms of the interactions that you'll see. It's all about trying to involve people, giving other people kudos, trying to bring people into your group. Um, I think there's a lot of that community happening on LinkedIn right now. And I think that it's something that is definitely worth utilizing. Um, and, and one thing that I, you know, I've been doing lots of reading and trying to, you know, figure out good ways for us to stay engaged at our agency and for me personally to stay engaged with the community. And a really good um, article I read actually made a really good point that utilize your weakest connections. If you want, if you want new connections and you want new leads, yeah, talking to people that you know really well or maybe have met in person and, and you would consider them a strong connection, that's great, but they are going to tend to know a lot of the things that you already know. They might know a lot of the people you already know, and so you're not going to be experiencing new things or new opportunities or, you know, getting connected to people outside your own circle. So um, one thing that I've been telling people to really kind of like push your boundaries is to utilize your weak connections because that's where you're going to start to make some newness in your own community.
Gabrielle or Amanda, do you have any tips you want to share? All right. Um, looks like we're getting a question about pay. I'll um, throw in there oh. really fast. Um, because Kate brought up a good point about LinkedIn, but obviously you're all attending a meetup right now. And I think that's fabulous and joining these types of calls and finding other, other groups that you're in, genuinely interested in, um, is going to be important, especially if we're not able to come together in the same ways that we have before. So continue to look for, for networking events through, through meetup, um, to plug 52 Limited again, we do a, a 10 minute Zoom call every morning at 9 a.m. Um, it's a great way to learn about things that are happening in our community and we, we talk to a variety of people. We've had 10 minutes of yoga. Um, this morning we had an author of a book that was about women of color in technology. Um, so find those types of events and attend. Um, Creative Mornings is having a really fun one on Friday with animals. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can keep networking um, and keep doing it as much as possible. Um, I'm super introverted, so I always find excuses not to um, not to go to events, and now I can't. Uh, so you know, just take a little solace that you know you can wear wear the nice blouse and your bike shorts at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I just love that tip about creative mornings and thinking about different different ways to connect. I actually met Amanda at Creative Mornings over a year ago, and now we here did. we're doing a different thing together. So yeah, <laughs> um, it's really cool to you know not just connect on LinkedIn, but to follow up and and make sure to foster those those good connections. Totally. Um, uh, I see we have. A question about pay in the chat, um, wondering if it's a common trend to, for pay to be a bit lower than it used to be. I think that goes along with the caution that we're seeing. And I, I don't think that it's necessarily indicative of companies realizing that they can now just pay less for things. Because I, I know that it probably feels that way, right? Like, oh, so many people are looking that now they don't have to offer me this much because you know, people are desperate or whatever. I don't think it's necessarily that. I think that a lot of the times um, th these companies are just struggling. And so, you know, they, they need people. And we've even seen people, um, you know, come to us and be like, hey, my manager just told me that they're, they're considering lowering my pay. Is that even like a thing? And so being a recruiter and having to kind of like feel that is really weird because we work with our client companies and we work with the talent that are in these roles. And so I think really just everyone is struggling. I mean, whether you're a company or you are the talent, it, it's, it's tricky for everyone to navigate. So I think that it might be something that is not quite known enough about yet for us to like have a true understanding of it but I think a lot of it does have to do just with like that that caution portion yeah we're seeing it exactly that um and there's been a few kind of pertinent examples that I can can bring up we've had just on our client side a few of our clients come to us and let us know that and that their clients, their end client who they are servicing has cut their budget in half, which means, you know, then that's half of what they can pay us. And so it kind of trickles down. So we're seeing a lot of that, um, but also, you know, just generally, I know that companies are trying to be really lean right now. We saw the big hit in layoffs, you know, a couple months back, at, by this point, um, and now companies are starting to rehire, again, like Kate said, with caution, with extreme crazy caution. Um, again, because I, I think there's a little bit of paranoia, there's still some uncertainty, and that's all feeding into that. I mean, you know, money always kind of drives that like fear and fight or flight mechanism in all of us depending on the situation um you know companies aren't aren't any different they're run by a human that's you know either going to get really scared and make a rash decision or you know kind of scale back and take things slowly so just know that yes we are seeing that we're seeing that from the client's perspective we're seeing you know slash and pay rates all around um, I know a lot of companies are doing work share programs and having to do some unemployment in addition to salaries. So 
there's just a lot going on. So compensation, I expect to be wonky until there is some sort of normalization. So it's unfortunate, not the news that anybody wants to hear, but, but be aware of it. And I would say too that it's not like something that is not being talked about. You know, it's it's not like these companies are like, well, oh well, I guess we just can't pay you enough. I mean, when we work with our client companies, we are constantly trying to come up with solutions that are going to work for them. Or you know, okay, well, great. What if if this position could be a three month role instead of a six month role, and then we reevaluate at that three month mark or whatever. You know, it is a conversation. So I think that that's another opportunity if you are seeing that if there's a position that you really love and it's just way below what you can consider. Ask, you know, like what is the what is the projected timeline look like for this, or what is the intention behind this role? So I think what Amanda was saying earlier too, just about being confident to just ask the things that you need to know before you move forward. Um, you're you're in your rights to ask as many questions as you need to to feel comfortable moving forward. And I think that that's huge right now because it's a conversation everyone's having. So it's a good time to you know be asking questions. I think. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, this is where my life coaching stuff kicks in, where I feel like, you know, a lot of times when you go into interviews, we forget that we have control. Like we we have the, we're in control of whether we choose the job or whether we want the job. You know, yes, they can hire us, but at the same time, we have some control there as well. So like Amanda said, you know, feel comfortable, confident enough to ask the questions that you want to know the answers to. I think that's important as well. Does anyone have any follow-up questions to that? Okay, okay. cool. Move on to a bit different topic. Um, how are you seeing candidates differentiate themselves, especially now when they're just starting out or changing careers? I can go. I think from my perspective, the biggest thing that helps me differentiate between, let's say it's two developers and they have really similar portfolios, really similar skill sets, I think being able to articulate um, why you're a good fit for the role at stake, why you're passionate about what you do, what your skills are. Interview skills are huge. And I mean, as a recruiter, we help with that. You know, if you're working with us and, and there is a role at stake, of course we help with that. But I think like any opportunity you can take, and it can be scary, like not everyone has these skills naturally, um, but just take the opportunity to talk to a friend, family member, talk about your work, talk about why you're a good fit for that role before you go in for the interview. Um, because I'll tell you what, like communication skills for me, especially right now, because everything is virtual and it comes down to, look, I can do the work and I can do it from home and I can be reliable. Um, that's huge. So like, even if, if someone has amazing, amazing technical skills, but I get on the phone with them and I cannot figure out <laughs> from point A to point B, what they're trying to explain to me, they're not as strong of a candidate, even if I'm looking at someone way more junior, right? So I think that that is really, really huge. And it's hard right now. And I think that's part of the reason I want to bring it up is because it's hard. I mean, working from home, not being in those situations that might make us feel uncomfortable because that's just our everyday lives being out and about and having to interact with people. You almost have to make the effort to go out of your way to have those interactions and, and talk to someone about it. Um, because I think for me, like as a recruiter, and I think a lot of hiring managers, that's really going to be what sets, sets you apart, to be honest. Gabrielle, is this, this something you're, you're coaching your clients on these days? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it just goes back to confidence for sure. Um, just helping them to build that confidence, have the confidence that they, that they want to just be able to walk bold, boldly into it and, um, and be ready to answer any questions that they have during the, you know, that they're asked during the interview and also um, being able to communicate, like Kate said, just being able to communicate, feeling comfortable with, uh, with their 
skill set, but also with their soft skills as well. Just being comfortable talking about who they are and what they bring to the table for sure. Yes. Can I also ask, um, do you have any exercises for finding that? Like what if you, the cliche, I don't know who I am. Um, like, uh, do you have any questions that you have people ask themselves? Um, one of the, one of the um, most popular exercises that I use because people, um, <laughs> We're all always like, a lot of people don't like to talk about themselves. And so I have them to start by writing down some of their accomplishments. Um, and it go, that I have them go all the way back to like childhood. And people are often so surprised at what all they have accomplished um, so far in their lives. And I think um, by taking a look at that list, you know, they're able to see themselves in a different light and see like, wow, I have done, you know, quite a bit. And I think that helps to build that confidence and to see what they, how far they've come. And it kind of gives them that boost to keep going. Yeah, I think I want to do that exercise. <laughs> like, like, I'm trying to think, I went back to my childhood and I was like, wait, I guess I could think of like, oh, if I kind of started stepping up with my little brother of like helping him do something or even, yeah, got my first A plus on a group project. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I could add oh, up. Yeah. yeah, the the smallest, the smallest all the way to the biggest accomplishment, for sure. They all count. Thank you. Um, we have one question submitted through our form. Um, I'm not sure who submitted that one, but I'll just read it out. Um, what projects should self-taught developers include in their portfolio when looking for their first job as front-end developers? Um, <laughs> I will, I will hop into this one. Uh, that is, is a very good question. And the fact that the person that, that asked that question knows, like, I should be putting these projects on my resume. Oh, that's so great. Um, because as a new developer, you have to, you have something to prove. Um, you want to prove that you can code. You want to show that while I don't have three years of experience, in a professional environment, I'm still capable of making this thing. Um, so I kind of hearkening over to, to Gabri what Gabrielle was just saying about accomplishments. Um, I tell people to write down the projects that they did in code school, they did in college, they did independently. And what is the best? Like pick the top three that have, that are, you know, the least amount of bugs or the most seamless that somebody could go in to the repository, review it and be like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. Um, submitting or, you know, you want to be careful on what you put on that resume. Um, but again, like Gabrielle said, it's a good idea to write down all of your accomplishments. So in this sense, writing all of your, kind of maybe creating a sec separate document from your resume that is just all of the projects that you did with a little description, like three bullet points and then the link to it. And as you're applying for jobs, pick out the ones that make the most sense for that job because that will show the hiring manager, one, you're paying attention to the job posting that you're, hi that, you know, they're, you're applying to. Um, and two, that you, you took the time to highlight that. That's really important. Um, because, you know, when we're just starting out and none of us are perfect, we all still need training and development and peers to help us out. Um, and soft skills are really the only way you can shine as a junior or entry level person in any industry. Doesn't matter if it's tech, creative, any of that. So projects are, again, important. You want to show the ones that have the least amount of mistake. But um, again, your soft skills are the thing that's going to have to shine the most over the top of a resume or over your GitHub or your portfolio. Um, because again, in, in the eyes of the employer, you have something to prove. So just something to keep, keep in the back of your head. But um, keep your samples on, on your resume as relevant as possible to the job that you're applying for. Use your portfolio and your GitHub for, for the dump of everything else um, and keep have it have it up there and um and updated i've seen some portfolios recently or or links um to personal sites that you know haven't been updated since 2018 um so yeah keep keep things as current as possible awesome. 
Kate, did you just unmute? Yeah, I was just going to say that's absolutely what my recommendation always is, is, you know, you want to get it out there. And I think exactly like Amanda was saying is having what I call a master resume almost, where you have everything on there that you've ever done that you feel like would be applicable to, you know, any scenario that you'd be applying for. Um, yeah, that's really great because it's super easy to take stuff off and weed it out and, you know, send that over versus like rewriting and, and designing a resume every time to fit. So make a master resume and take out the stuff that you think might not be applicable. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, this might be a bit more of like a design centric approach, but what I always tell people is like, put out in the universe what you want to be doing. So, you know, if there are projects that you love and exactly what Amanda said too, like you want to make sure that you're not putting out super messy work or things that are unfinished without an explanation. I do think that there is a place for process work. Um, but if there's something where you're like, well, this wasn't, you know, for an actual client, but I love it and I worked really hard on it and you know I feel like maybe I shouldn't be putting personal work out there because it doesn't seem like you know it should be on a resume or should be on a portfolio if that's what you want to be doing and you did you know you did a good job and that's what you hope that's what you're aspiring to do in your next position that stuff should totally be on your portfolio and your resume so don't don't let it stop you um if it's not something that you did for an actual client or an actual employer, because I think when you're junior and you're looking for work, anything that showcases what you want to be doing and what you're good at is totally valuable to have on there. Great. Um, I hear a lot from the people that I work with who do the hiring that they like to see people go above and beyond the free code camp projects or something, just building upon something you've learned so uh, that you kind of differentiate yourself from, from everybody else who's done the same project. Um, kind of have kind of a related question to that. Um, a lot of folks coming out of boot camps uh, might be coming out with group projects. Um, how, what's the best way to share what your involvement was in those group projects? Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit harder. Um, I think those are going to be less relevant samples. Um, regardless, um, if all of the projects that you have to show for are group projects, it's, it's going to be really hard to prove to a hiring manager that you can also work independently. So those are nice to include, but I also think that coming from the content, if, if you think of it this way, you know, we're all contributing equal parts when we're working in a group, right? Or theoretically, <laughs> you're contributing equal parts when you're in a group. Um, so it's not really showing all that you can do. So I would, personally, I would avoid adding that to a resume um, unless it's a specific project, like you're applying for an e-commerce Shopify developer sort of thing, and you've got, you've built out a, a site with a shopping cart and you've done this all before. Um, you know, but you did it with a group that I would, you know, keep them relevant. Um, but I think that's a lot harder of a thing to really call your own professional experience, um, when it was done, you know, kind of in a, a group setting. Um, I don't know, there may be other opinions. I have not seen that done well. Um, but, uh, uh you know, I, yeah, that's, that's a very difficult question. I may have just talked myself into circles. No, I agree. That's a hard one to answer. And that is something that I even struggle with being a recruiter when, I, when I'm reviewing a portfolio and I see that. Um, and I think the biggest thing I can say is being transparent and being honest about what part you played in that is important because it drives me nuts and it will drive every hiring manager nuts if they find out that something that was on your portfolio you only did a certain little part of and it wasn't clear. So I think that it's always good to be transparent and be like, you know, I've seen it done in different ways. Um, I agree that I don't think the most successful portfolios are going to mainly consist of group projects, but I do think that there are times where it might be valuable to add them, um, especially for junior people. I know that that might be the majority of your work, but you know, there, there's plenty of other disciplines that I'll see that too. I mean, like, let's look at like color material designers and within the apparel design industry, you know, they work on a shoe together, right? And so you have a color designer and a materials designer and they, they work together to create one product. And so I think it really comes down to, um, first of all, getting your partner's 
uh, permission to share share the work because it's not just yours. So that's huge. And if you can, you can put their names on on the project itself and just be like, here's what I did. This is what I was in charge of. And then really just walk through the process that you took. And I think that that's an effective way to show like, yes, this was a group project, but this this was my responsibility. And here is artifacts of what I actually did. So there are ways, but you definitely have to think about it, I think, a little bit more than other things. Um, so, you know, it, it really just depends on the project, it depends on the situation. Um, one way I was able to make that work as a developer is I did a group project um, with some people and we used GitHub. Um, and so they could very clearly see what commits were mine. Uh, so I think maybe it might be a little bit easier for a developer than a designer to prove what parts you did. So, um, totally. yeah. actually, good call. Uh, have you used abstract? I haven't used it yet, but Kate, maybe you, does abstract kind of have a GitHub version where you can see who commits to I'm not abstract sure familiar with it, but I'm reading the comment okay. actually over here too. And it's like, yeah, I mean, not all hiring managers are going to have an issue with that. You know, okay. a lot of hiring managers know the questions to ask to kind of get to the bottom of it. And it's going to be very apparent if you, yeah. <laughs> so I think that I don't think that it's necessarily, it can be trickier, but I don't think it's necessarily a huge obstacle to overcome a group project. And another thing, and I, just to kind of cap on that as well, not everyone that comes out of code school has worked with GitHub. I know that seems crazy or has an account or has built a portfolio. Um, I get hundreds of resumes from junior developers that don't have a single link on their resume. The reference group projects and you know and that's why I say I haven't seen it done well I think if you send a link to your github I'm gonna feel a lot better than you know looking just directly at a, a, a resume that says that you've done all of these things and, and you can't kind of show the work so Trisha makes a good point um, if you have done group projects through github highlight that it's obvious um, then who's done the work um, but again, what more what I think what we've seen more frequently is folks that haven't built out a resume like that. Um, people that haven't been set up. Some code schools do a really, really good job of setting you up with some basic entering the workforce tools, but most don't. Um, I think the majority of applicants that we see are more from like free code camp versus, you know, Epicodus or Alchemy Code Labs that have, you know, great reputations in Portland. So just something to add in there. This question from Esther can kind of piggyback off of that um, from new folks in the industry. Um, they are asking about tips about applying for an internship or what you're looking for in a person who's applying for an internship with a company. Well, to be completely blunt and honest, um, as a recruiter, at least at our agency, we don't work on a lot of internships. And I think that just has to do with the scope of work that we work on here at Aquint and Vitamin T. Um, but my, like, if I was tasked with, you know, helping place someone in an internship, I think honestly, it would come back to, and we, I, we already talked about this a lot, but um, are those soft skills really ultimately? I think that a lot of um, internship programs are built around really trying to see if you would be a fit at the company. I think that honestly is where a lot of a lot of those programs come from. And so, you know, if you're from a certain program or if you have the, you know, you have the technical know-how based on the school um, that you went to or whatever, you know, that's sort of a given. They're looking at applicants, you know, who have all that same stuff. I mean, there's not really anything that sets you apart um, if you're still in school or if you're newly out of school um, in, in a technical sense. So yes, of course, a portfolio is important and your work is important, but I think it's really going to come down to like, why do you want the internship? How much do you know about the company? Why do you feel that you're a good fit for the company? What do you want to learn from that company? So really just doing your research and, and practicing those soft skills of communication and, you know, a, a little bit about um, what Gabrielle was saying, where it's like, you know, let's talk about what my accomplishments are. I think that that stuff is, is really what I would gravitate towards if I was going to try and place someone in, in an internship. Yeah, we do uh, quite a few internships at my company. Um, and mostly what we're looking for is um, cultural fit for the most part. 
Um, and so we're, we're definitely, like Kate said, we're looking at the soft skills. We're looking at, you know, personality type, just seeing if it, if it will be a fit for the company. Um, because during the internship, we're doing a lot of, um, it's almost like a boot camp. So we're teaching them most of, you know, many of the skills um, that they need to know. So it's not so much as the tech of the technical stuff as it is more of the communication and team player and, you know, that type of stuff. Um, we have a little bit more time before we're going to break everyone out into the rooms. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, and then just want to make sure everyone saw my message that if you want to be in the portfolio group versus the resume group, um, go ahead and put your name in the chat. Um, and it looks like we just got one question in the chat um, from Anna. Uh, what do you look for in resumes of candidates that are switching fields? Um, I think that something that from a recruiting perspective is really important is just having a robust skills section. Um, that's like one of the number one things I look at on a resume. Um, like, you know, we look through tons and tons and tons of different candidates. Um, so obviously you want to have your applicable work experiences on there. Um, if you've, you know, had a gap here or there because you took, you know, a position that you don't feel like is applicable for that role, you know, that's going to just depend on what, what the, you know, role at stake is, because I think in some cases it makes sense to leave certain things off. I think in other cases, hiring managers are going to be like, well, what, why do you have a gap on here? So, it depends on the scenario um, in terms of what you're actually listing for work experience itself. Um, but definitely always have any education you have on there, even if it's something where you haven't quite finished it yet. I think that there is always a place for like, you know, I will be completing this certificate at, at this date or, you know, in progress or whatever. I think that stuff is really important because it shows that you're working towards something. Um, but that skills section is huge because like I was saying, as a recruiter, we're looking at tons and tons and tons of different resumes and hiring managers, even sometimes, you know, they're looking at hundreds of resumes a week. Um, and so having a skills section of soft skills and technical skills, proficiencies, um, that is helpful because that gives sort of a quick glance at what, what those skills are. And then if that catches a recruiter's eye or the hiring manager's eye and they decide to read through the rest of your resume, they can contextualize the rest of those experiences that you have on that resume with those skills in mind. So I think it's really good to have the skills at the top. It depends again on what you're applying for. Um, but especially if you're junior, like really having that, um, or junior or if you're transitioning careers like like the question um, stated but yeah just having that section really clear and concise I think is really helpful as a viewer of resumes. <laughs> you think I'm real nodding is that anything to add or just agreeing okay. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more questions? Um, I think we had one um, also about fully meeting requirements or preferred skills, um, how to navigate that um, if you don't fully meet all of the requirements in a job listing. Um, I mostly tell people try to meet 75% of what they, you know, people have asked for on the job description. Um, it's unrealistic for you to be expected to for anybody be to be expected to have everything but the kitchen sink um but you need to also feel confident that you can do what you're what, what's being asked of in the job description um so think about that evaluate that when you're applying to positions um can i do 75 percent of this and ask for help you know the other 25 percent of the time um i think that's a that's a good way to to frame it in your mind um, and then that way you're not setting yourself up for interviewing for a position that you are not confident that you can fulfill. Um, I think that's kind of the best way to, to gauge that. I mean, you could fudge the numbers a little bit. It could be like 65%, but you know, you, whatever you're most comfortable with, um, I think is really what's kind of the best way to, to go about that. Um, for example, if you are, applying for an entry-level JavaScript developer position and you've 
only ever worked with React, but you've learned a little bit about Vue, you've heard about it, you've gone to a couple of meetups, you're confident that you can pick it up on the job and work with other people, which, you know, in an entry level position is, is expected, like that you're going to, you know, learn from your peers and kind of figure things out that way. Um, but yeah, so, so kind of within reason, evaluate what you're going to be able to learn while you have that position and what you can hit the ground running doing right away. Great. I think if nobody else has any questions, I'm happy to chat, take one more in the chat if somebody has one. Um, but if not, I think that we're going to go ahead and split people up into the portfolio uh, resume groups. And we'll have, we have a question or, okay. Um, we're going to have Kate in the portfolio group. Um, and Amanda and Gabrielle are going to be in the resume group. Um, and we have some resumes that were submitted online um, and also some portfolios. So we'll just see how many we can, we can take a look at. Okay, so if we're all ready, I'll press the button. <laughs> Oh, it's just a, uh, just a note that we're all going to come back together. Oh yeah. Uh, at the end. Um, I have it open for 40 minutes and it will set a timer for 60 seconds. Is that good with you, Trisha? Yep. That sounds great. Okay, great. Thank you. Here we go. Did it work? Did that work? Do we have everyone here? No?
That was fast. Hey, everybody. <laughs> it's just like magic. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Whoa. Here we all are. <laughs> Looks like maybe we've got everybody back now. I'm on mute. That doesn't help anything. How did everything go in the portfolio room? I thought it went great. Yeah, Kate had great feedback. We had some good questions and great portfolios to review. So thank you everyone who submitted and to Kate for reviewing. Um, how, is, how is the resume group? So good. Um, we had a lot of great resumes. Um, there was um, Amanda and Gabrielle gave kind of the top level bullet points that we gave or came up with. Um, basically put a personal statement and put it up at the top so you grab the attention of the, um, the person hiring you um, to keep reading. I'm butchering this. Gabrielle and Amanda, please save me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I did listen to you. You just sounded so better, so much better when you said it. Uh, um, what was it? Okay. Um, right. <laughs> no, I can't remember what I even just said. Like, oh, I messed it up. Um, yeah. The, 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 Gabrielle's on mute. The time, the, you're right about the, the summary section, your professional statement, and both Gabrielle and I talked about this. Um, we want to know a little bit about you, and then we want to know more. And that's consistent mm -hmm. for, for hiring managers. Like, team fit and culture is huge, and that's going to be really, really big right now. Um, so give a little bit of information about yourself whether it is an objective statement or a professional summary, or even just an about me section. Those are three different things, but they each can grab attention in different ways. So stylistic things to do that. Um, remove dates from your education. Um, remove pictures from your resume. That was another one I forgot to bring up. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a picture of yourself on your resume, take it off. Um, you want to make sure that you are not creating any bias, anything that could go against your favor. Is that the right thing to say? Sorry, I'm getting tired. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything that could potentially hurt you and cause bias, you want to take off of your resume. So a picture, dates of education, those things, you know, if you've got a bachelor's degree, I don't have to know that you got it in 1988. Um, that's not my business. Uh, so those are, are kind of the big things that I people were doing right, actually, in the resumes that we looked mm -hmm. at. So, Gabrielle, sorry, you were on mute before. Did you have anything else to add there? No, she caught it. She got it. Okay, great. I feel bad. I feel like you, you should have gotten that because, I mean, you're the life coach. You are. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. We got it. <laughs> yes. What were the bullet points from yours, Trisha, or Kate? You're glowing, Trisha. I know. <laughs> I, uh, I, just, I just moved into a new house and we don't have blinds yet. I can't see oh, no. anything. <laughs> You're radiant. Thanks. <laughs> um, anyway, Kate had a lot of great UX um, um, feedback. Um, I don't know if you want to give any summary, Kate. I think the biggest takeaway for me personally and something really good to remind everyone about is we talked a lot about accessibility um and so mm -hmm. you know there are a lot of sites that have motion graphics on them and we talked a lot about how just for accessibility terms um having an option to turn that off is really huge and so even other things like that i think that's a huge topic right now and it's going to continue to be a huge topic um so if you can get ahead of the game and make sure that your portfolio is showcasing that stuff um, WCAG or WCAG or, um, you know, there's some of those regulations that are, that are government issued type things the way I understand it. Um, start reviewing that now, because if you have that on a portfolio that you know how to do that, or you know about that, and if you, if your own portfolio site implements that, that's huge. So I thought that was really good that we had the space to talk about that. And while we're on that topic, Trisha, we need to follow up and see if we can still have that event we are planning. Um, yes. Regarding accessibility, um, Carrie Goyne, um, she's a local to Portland um, accessibility expert cool. in terms of the UX. So hopefully yeah, we can I still think, have that event. Stay tuned. Yeah, that was, I think that was later in the year, maybe September. So we'll, yeah. we'll try to, to bring you an accessibility event soon. Uh, and thanks for Posey for, for bringing that up in, in the portfolios. Yeah. We really okay. appreciated that. 
Anybody Anything have else? any last questions before we wrap up? I'm gonna check the chat real quick. Just give you a minute or two um, if anybody wants to, to come off of mute. So we're getting a lot of thank yous for um, our panelists. And I do wanna thank everyone who has attended this meeting or this um, meetup because um, this would be a lot less fun if there were like three of us in the room. <laughs> I mean, that would be its own kind of party, but it is really fun to see so many participants like actively participating in the, in the meetup. So thank you really for, for bringing everything um, that you are and for submitting your portfolios. I know we kind of sent that out Sunday afternoon before our holiday. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to fill that out and participate with us. Yeah, and thank you so much to, to all of our panelists. We just really appreciate you um, sharing your time and expertise with us and just having these fun events that we can come together and chat. Thank you guys for putting this together. <laughs> Very smooth. Oh, thank you oh, so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was my all first right. breakout room, so that went well. Me too. This <laughs> all right. Hey. <laughs> Only the second time I've had to use breakout rooms, and this went much better. Yay. <laughs> so, good job, everybody. Yes. So, yeah. I'll just reiterate again if anyone has questions for me, follow up stuff. I mean, I look at portfolios all day long, like, I can okay. chat anytime. So, um, yeah, please just hit me up later. I know you have contact info and everything we can probably send it out again or whatever so um yeah just I'm, I'm here to help like that's our big thing right now is we just want to help people you know if you guys have questions about how to get the jobs you want or you know something really really nitpicky on a resume I, I want to reach I want you to reach out like I, I want to have that conversation thank you Kate that's great that's important oh so is that open to you too Gabrielle for oh resumes? yeah for okay sure. yeah likewise and I know we just said this in our resume room too, but um, our Caitlin's going to send out our contact information. Mm -hmm. um, it's a weird time, but still send, send me resumes, send me questions. I will answer quickly. Supporting the community is just huge right now. And, and I almost like a little emotional saying this, but this is just a wonderful event to be a part of and a community to be a part of right now. Um, just helping each other out is, mm -hmm is so meaningful. Um, whoa, sorry. Lots of feet. I was feeling that oh, too. I know, <laughs> I know. No. Ah, they're so hard. Somebody um, had to say it. <laughs> so it was, it was very inspiring to just get questions and feel valued by, by my community and, you know, our opinions being valued. It's, it's great to be able to share knowledge and help each other out right now. With your nine um, years of experience as of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love the happy tears. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any last words from it's getting anyone? a lot of thank yous and, and love for the Portland community, which I, I echo. Yes. Yeah. Portland Thanks plus everybody. global. <laughs> so thank you everyone. We'll, we'll let you get to, to get to bed or contacting um our panelists with uh, further questions. I guess it's 7:20, so I'm not going to go to bed. At, never mind. But <laughs> I will have some tea because I'm yawning. Um, well, hold okay. on. It's it's 10:20. Okay, Gabrielle can go to bed. <laughs> go to bed. <laughs> <Gabrielle's Not> out. <laughs> and, and those in Brazil and everywhere else in the world. Thank you again for tuning in. Um, we'll share information about our next meetup soon. All thank right. You everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.